So I'm Professor Jean Camp, and uh, with me here today is Sanchari Dawes, who is completing her doctorate in usable security from her uh, building on her foundation of computer engineering. Andrew Dingman, all things Red Hat, could not be with us, with us here today. Jean Paolo Russo is here. He is a PhD JD student, which means he can violate the CFAA and get himself out of trouble after doing it. So why did we decide to do uh, the particular uh, Ubico choice is because when you look at two-factor options, it is the best in class in usability. One option, so you have SMS and the one-time password apps, but one thing about the SMS is that I have literally interviewed and worked with thousands of participants, and none of them, not one, has had three hands. So it ends up that it does interrupt the login. Sorry, I just want to make sure where we are. And the other concern about apps that some people have is that you have data that you're sharing probably with your boss. Um, so if you look at location data and some of this other information, you would be sharing, did you go to a party last night? Which party did you go to? And who did you drink with? So these are concerns that would confuse any study of any of these other systems. So we decided to use a physical token, the Ubico. It has been considered best in class by others. And why did we use it? It's cryptographically strong. We're giving the participants in our study something that we can rely on and that we have confidence in. It is physically interoperable, and the interaction appears quite simple. So we started the study. We weren't even sure that we would find any stop points. Certainly, our group pilot did not. So what is uh, usability and acceptability, right? And why do we at all need such? Uh, studies. So Sohano mentions five core attributes of a security token, that it should be scalable uh, because we really want to use it, it should be theft resistant definitely, it should be secure and it should be memory less. And you can carry these keys anywhere, it's lightweight and you do not need to recharge it, you do not need to store any information and so on. So it does follow all the five key attributes of a security token. Uh, what Mollick and Nelson tells about usability is that we should use clear languages. So for example, not everybody needs to know about the security jargons because we are not just talking to the security enthusiasts like us, but we are also talking to normal people who are very well established in their profession but don't really need security tools to tell them what they need to know about security, right? And also, it should have clear error messages, it should have exit statuses, it should be usable. Unfortunately, uh, these keys uh, kind of lack in some of the things because they do not provide clear feedback or clear error messages, and we will talk about it later on. Um, Lang mentions that uh, usage of the security keys is brainless and we often get frustrated when we talk to humans who don't know about security. But we have to understand that they do not need to know in details what it is. So how do you distinguish usability research from hanging out in the bar and getting shared opinions? And I want to talk about three methods that we both used to develop this study and that are generally usable in all context as methods for evaluating usability. It specifically, the facilitated cognitive walkthroughs, facilitated brainstorming, and focus groups. So in a cognitive walkthrough, as a designer, you pretend to be a user. You say, oh, this is the thing I wanted to get done. Let me go through each step. Do I have to go through a menu? Do I have to hit an external information source to get data? And you try to identify stop points. And to tell you the truth, your, um, our stop points are almost never the ones that our users and participants come up with. So that is just the designer or just a couple of designers who are walking through it themselves. And then the facilitated brainstorming is when you bring in, so we bring in some targeted subject participants and we uh, go through the study with them and they ask them what they think and do they have opinions about the study. And because 
we really cannot step outside of our own knowledge. Like we're just a cat trying to jump through its own collar if we try to pretend that we're looking at a technology the same way someone with no experience or training is. And then you can engage in focus groups. Now, I realize some of you might disagree with this, but as an academic, I have reams of references to back this up. People are generally nice. And if you tell them you're the designer, they'll want to say nice things. They will want to be positive. So we pull the designers out of this entirely. When we test our own designs, we make it clear that this student is not one of the design group. And in this, you can get uh, better bad answers, for example. If you're trying to say, all right, uh, what do you do to fix a router? People will come up with answers that you might not imagine, like, you know, call the Comcast help desk. Okay, call your bank. All right, well, that's a naive answer that you now want in your survey. So the thing is, people are lost and confused, and then they don't know why they at all need to factor authentication. So as you can see here, uh, to make it more usable and so that they definitely do not break it, the form factor was made accordingly so that it can insert both ways. But we found participants who inserted it in the reverse order and they couldn't find the golden button or they thought, okay, the device doesn't work, which is the easy way out. So we did a two-phase study. We followed the same protocol in both the phases and it happened over a course of two years. And we had an initial survey asked to the participants, then we followed a think aloud protocol where they registered the keys. And then there was an exit survey where we asked certain questions about the keys, about their experiences, there was qualitative analysis and we made certain recommendations to the organization. After some of them were accepted and there were several changes made in the instructions, we did the similar set of protocol in the second phase as well over year two with a similar set of participants. So what questions were asked? All these questions were designed from a previous study who studied about 900 participants and they said those who scored more than 3.5 according to their scale were termed as experts in computer and security expertise skills. So we asked questions whether they have developed a website, whether they know about what security tools are and other related questions and whether they at all require help in their computer day-to-day -day activity. And we studied participants who were security enthusiasts because they were enrolled in a security course and we particularly wanted to know about the technically sound people. Afterwards, which, okay, so we gave them randomly assigned Ubico as well as Google instructions to check the efficacy between the two sets of instructions. Later on, we followed a think aloud protocol. So think aloud protocol is when people uh, do a task and they think aloud whatever they are feeling. So for example, people have shown their frustration that this instruction is too wordy, I have to go back and forth. So as to understand in what levels or in what ways we can help the people. They also said good things. Okay, this is convenient, I can carry it everywhere, I like the color blue and all sorts of things. So we recorded everything. The researchers who were associated with the project notes and then we did the analysis and how we did the interviews right the interviews were worded in a way where we wanted to ask about what they understood by the keys so that they don't overestimate or underestimate the capabilities of the keys and it was open-ended we said them okay whatever you feel uh, we asked questions uh, such as what will happen if you lose the key, um, how will you check the confirmation of operation, and many of them said that it, you can go to the incognito mode and check it, but we have to understand these are people who are security enthusiasts and not the people who are like general audience or even like vulnerable population. And we didn't want them to like get locked out of their personal Gmail account, right, because they were participating. Next, we, after a month of this entire experiment, we did a follow-up survey. Again, we wanted to check whether, okay, fine, they were using it, but they, if they are continually using it or not. So what we found that uh, it was not surprisingly, but many of the people dropped the keys as soon as the experiment was over. Please keep in mind that these are like 
expensive keys for like an undergraduate student, who, like me, I will just go for free food, but the thing is, it is very difficult for them to kind of drop this expensive keys. But that means it's not the cost of the product, it's also how we are using it or how they find it important. People have mentioned in the follow-up survey, uh, nobody in, actually replied back in phase one. In phase two, they said, okay, I don't find it useful, my account is not confidential enough, but somebody also said that I want to just use it for curiosity and so on. After the data was collected, we transcribed, and researchers sat and we did qualitative analysis. We found three points, which was one was halt point, where uh, the participants were stopped and required the intervention of a researcher. The reason being what happens when in real life scenario, people are stopped at that particular instance. Next, we found confusion point, like we do, we are confused and probably uh, we just do Google search and try to find it. And people kind of did it and find their way on their own. There were value points. So for example, the key had a golden button. People thought that it's a biometric reader. It creates a false sense of security because they have kept their keys and they think that without their biometric or fingerprint, it cannot be hacked or it cannot, you cannot log into their account, which is not true. And that's why they shared it with their friends, which is again a false sense of security. So at the end of this study, we came forward with a set of recommendations. The first was, make it so that people can find instructions. The second was the demo that was provided was provided to make things easy, to make things simple. Instead, what happened was our users played along with the demo, and then they said, this is great, I've enrolled, uh, I'm con I have two-factor authentication, and in fact, all they had done is kind of play acted with the demo. It was not connected to their account at all. The device identification was problematic for people, the idea of biometric versus touch. Confirmation of operation was quite difficult. After they successfully enrolled, they were unable to determine that they had successfully enrolled. And the big issue with acceptability was the benefit and the risk. We also had some issues that we did not think that the instructions could uh, could address, and that was people would put the key in the computer and then they'd open the computer and say, oh, this is a USB, so it's got files on it. So that was interesting. Here is the first phase of how you, how you distinguish. This is more about selling, and as you see, as you look at each one, there's a little bit of information about what it does and then the read more. So this was the second phase that does a better job of distinguishing the functionality. More than a third of it is based on the functionality of the key, and it also shows more keys. This is what we call, in the usability, a wall of text. So these were the initial instructions. There was a demo, and then m much text. And this is what it was after our proposed changes. So it was much easier, and then they just simply said, it's a capacitive sensor, not a biometric. So that was a very clear, direct, actionable uh, result of the recommendations. So let's talk about what we found in our study. So as you can see, just the removal of demo from the start page to a page which was better hidden, if people want to find it out, they can, but if they don't, they are not going yet. You can see a stark improvement in phase two. About 72% of our participants were really stopped at that point, and you can see the improvement. You can also see the improvement for incorrect settings. So for example, when they talked about go to the settings, instead of going to their personal account setting, they go, went to the browser setting, which is probably obvious to us, but if you just say settings, people are confused. Uh, then you can see even the instruction and the form factor they said, put it into the goal side up and so on. Even for confusion, you can see, though there is improvement in some sectors for like even instructions, people are still confused. Because though they have made it like really short to the point or something like that, people are still going back and forth, which is confusing, and they wanted more pictures, but probably not demo. 
So we also prove that definitely these small changes which might seem like it doesn't have any implication, but these security design changes actually improve the security as well as usability. Because if a person cannot even register the key and if it is a hassle for that person, they are definitely not going to use it. So demo versus reality was a major success and we could see uh, that people were getting more acceptable to the changes and they wanted to learn more about it. What we really want to emphasize is we really want a confirmation of operation. So the thing is not to track the users, they don't uh, email them back or they don't send the messages, but how are we going to get confirmed that the operation was done or they are going to use the UB keys? So they really want it. The going to incognito mode is not a solution because not everybody knows there is an incognito mode. Communicate the intrinsic benefit. The thing about security is until and unless it is breached, you really don't care about it. You can have like a thousand days being secure and you don't understand the change. The one day the data is breached and everything is gone. So we have to communicate the intrinsic benefits as well as the risk associated with it. Because people are buying the keys, they are spending some money or they are taking it or carrying it everywhere and it is a hassle for some people who probably just lose their key somewhere. But then again, we have to say like you can lock your door with the keys or you can just keep it open. Definitely somebody can break the windows and get inside of it, but we want to make it much of a hassle for the breaker or for the thief or the hacker, right? So we want to increase the cost of hacking and also communicate the risks. And we have to have proper communication what risks we are dealing with. So for example, if we asked about the participant, why don't you want to use it? They said, okay, my account is not confidential enough. If I work for some organization, I might because it's just regular college emails. But when we ask, is your financial institute associated with it? Are you doing some online banking transactions with it? And then they say yes. And there was this, oh, what? Well, and then that's why this is really confusing and we have to communicate according to the audience because different audience communicate differently. And so this brings us to the future work, which is the risk communication. How do you motivate acceptability and usability? Because pe people have to be able to use it and they have to want to use it. So one way we're doing this is by looking at successes in risk communication in other domains, particularly health. So this is the wall of text version of that smoking kills. And just like you don't need to know what fishing is, not to be, not to be fished, you don't need to know what paranoid plastic phenomenon are to know not to smoke. I hope I said that right. And so what you need to do is summarize risk. Here we have a set of uh, current permissions descriptions, simplified permissions descriptions, and icon, simple iconic risk permissions. Because we're not going to communicate to users what is a security problem. You have people like, oh, my machine is slow, so it's insecure. It's like, no, it's slow because you opened 400 tabs. Um, that what we want to do is provide clear, urgent risk communication. And I have to say, we do not always excel at that. Right now, you can see these are two major vulnerabilities. They're very severe vulnerabilities. But the image is like, oh, look, it's like Casper the Ghost, and he bought a stick, and we can do marshmallows. So that's not clear risk communication. Here's how the cigarette packages look in Australia. That is risk communication. Right? This is, this is a very serious and scary thing. So we've developed some videos and communication to address password behavior. These all, these add up to quite a bit more than 100% because many people selected multiple answers because they behave differently in different contexts. But you can see there's a tremendous amount of password reuse and password sharing, even in critical passwords. So we developed this video that we're going to test. Yes, we believe these are single-use items, and um, so that's risk sharing. Oh, yes. <laughs> and so, that, 
Wait, I want to say that's under Creative Commons off our website if, well, if you want it. Yeah. And so what are the takeaways from these studies or our presentation? So definitely providing the technology itself is not enough. We have to communicate, we have to motivate the users because it is very difficult to tell them, okay, why security is needed. We have to come, we cannot predict. So for example, when we did our pilot studies or we predicted the irrationality, we found that, okay, probably we are not stopped at demo because we know about it. Uh, but we have to watch in action and that's why the experiment is needed. We have to communicate why. We do not have to communicate how they are doing it. Uh, risk communication is for motivation. We have to give periodic feedback. So for example, if we, we do not give produ productive feedback to our employees or even to us, then we might not get motivated to do the research or even we might not get motivated or mo motivate the users to use such device and so on. And qualitative studies should be quantified definitely to see the statistical benefits and the analysis, but the thing is qualitative analysis also show that why and where the users are lacking. They can show, okay, the users are not using it, probably 90% of the people and 10% of the people are using it, but we have to show where they are lagging so that we can improve them. So unfortunately, Google has, uh, Ubico has uh, kind of directed their instructions to their several collaborations, and I was talking with the people there. The reason they do is, is like without even informing them, Google or their collaborations kind of change the instructions, and it is very difficult to keep up with all those instructions. But we should say we should have kind of find a balance between what is usable as well as how we can communicate to the users as to make the entire experience secure, as well as to motivate the users to have better security practices. So don't give up. Um, so these are our, if you have any questions further, you can tweet us, email us, and so on. Thank you so much.